Hi, I'm Bob Garrett. Hackensack University Health Network believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important health issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Hackensack University Medical Center Foundation, Investors Bank, Felician University, a 21st century education based on timeless values, New Jersey Resources, the North Ward Center, and by Cone Resnick, Accounting, Tax, and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by New Jersey Family Magazine and NJFamily.com. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got it. this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce a former colleague who is now a superstar over at uh, PIX11, Brenda Blackman, the anchor over there, one of the great anchors. How are you doing? I'm doing great. My gosh, you look wonderful. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the point. The point is you not only look great, but are doing great. Hey, how, what is the key? I got to ask you this. We worked together at another network for many, many years, right? What is the key to staying in the game? That was my nine, by the way, a part of the Fox family. What is the key to remaining successful and on the top of your game in the TV news business? What's the key? You know No, 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 no. You know what it is. You never stop. You okay. keep going, you keep the energy up, mm. and you love life. It is such a challenge, and you look at that challenge every single day. I mean, I'm tweeting out, I'm doing Facebook, I'm using social media to encourage, to inspire, mm. because I have to uplift myself, too. That's what it's about. If you're here, if you're alive, if you're able to wake up every morning, there is no reason you shouldn't be saying, Yay, I am going to do something wonderful today. See, that's the thing um, that always struck me about you. You're positive, and people can have this fake positive attitude that you can crack in a second when things go bad. That's not you. The, only, the thing I always remembered about you, and I still see in you today, is shows get canceled, contracts don't get renewed. <laughs> Believe me, I've been there. Um, <laughs> but you always stay positive, and you bring that positive energy around you. And I see it now. Uh, Sue Kanye, one of your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tish, she's great. She was here she? right in she's the so Tish. She was here wonderful. at the Tish studio just recently. And we were talking about that. What responsibility do you feel, particularly with the show that you do? By the way, tell everyone, everyone can see you. Oh, 6.30 every night, Kaidi Tong and I, we try to bring it because we're the only two women bringing you local New York news. Mm. Nobody else does that. 6.30, you got the network guys. Mm. We're two women, two power women, doing it. What responsibility do you feel to your audience to carry yourself the way you do, to bring that positive attitude? Well, for one thing, anybody who says they're not a role model, I mean, they're lying to themselves. I think any time we're adults, we have to be role models to children to say, try to act better because we're trying to be better ourselves and we're trying to teach you a better way to do that. I mean, basic things like saying please and thank you and having good manners. Mm. I mean, there's some really simple things we can do so often, you know, and you know how it is. I mean, kids are raising kids, so we just have to try and just be nicer to one another. Basics. Brenda, when did you know that broadcasting would be your professional life? It came to me. I don't think I really went to it. In fact, I was telling you the story of being in New York. Believe, can I tell you a really quick story about sure. me and my mom? I was coming here on a CBS junket. I was working on a, in my hometown, Channel 3 in Columbus, came on a CBS junket to New York City 
first time coming to New York, my mom and I are walking on the streets saying good morning to everyone. <laughs> we're from Columbus, are they Georgia. At you? Yeah, we're from Columbus, Georgia, looking, and they're looking at us like, what on earth and why are they talking to us? Mm. Oh my God, I said, Mom, I want to live and work there one day. This was in the early 70s. Got a chance to ride around the carriage in New York, and that's how I did my first stand up. I was interviewing people like this, that tells you how long ago. People like Jose Ferrer. Yeah. People like the, some of the Y and R soap opera people who were on the air back then who are still on the air. <laughs> I mean, Young and the Restless. <laughs> yes. I got the Y and R. <laughs> you got the Y and R. That's how much I love yes, it. Yes, yes. Yes. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's how it was, and that was my dream. And today I can say, Mom, you're not here anymore. Mm. But I am, I did it, and I didn't do it alone. You know, you're very, the other thing about you is your faith your spiritual uh, connection. Uh, always been powerful, why? Well, you know why. Um, mm, talk about, talk about <laughs> your daughter, go ahead. Um, and I can't do that without crying. I, know, That's not right, fair. I got all this I, makeup I, on I said and I wasn't gonna do this to you. Oh. I said, I promised myself I wasn't gonna do this. And I remember, people say back in the day, but this is, I remember your daughter early on and talk about it. Well, you know, May is Lupus Awareness Month, so it's probably a very good time to talk about it. We're uh, shooting in May, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to start. I guess I can start with that book uh, I gave you, Brenda Black, A Mom's Story. A Mom's um, Story. Uh, I often start just by reading the first page of that book because uh, I got a chance to testify before the Food and Drug Administration and tell them the story of my daughter. She has lupus. Yes. And I was one of those moms in denial when she was in college. I mean, she was this fabulous child that I thought would, you know, get her law degree, meet the man of her dreams, and go on to do fabulous things. But she got sick. And her college roommate called me, said, Kelly's sick. And I said, you know, like a Southern mom, put some Vaseline on her, whatever mm. it is, honey, she'll be just fine. But she wasn't just fine. Came home, got diagnosed with lupus. She still graduated from college with honors. But in 2007, ended up in ICU 52 days on life support. We literally had to ask people around the world to pray for her. Doctors said she wasn't going to make it. Lupus attacked her brain. When a doctor looks at you in the eye and tells you that your daughter is going to die, I mean, I thought lupus was um, just something that happened to other people's kids, certainly mm. not mine. And um, I learned the hard way, you know, what it was. And every day I would go to work, and every night I would go and sit in ICU with my daughter. And uh, that, was, that was life then, and just praying every day. and. One day she opened her eyes and uh, it was, because she was married at the time, um, I had no say so. Uh, and fortunately, I believe God brings people in your life for a season and a reason. And he said, I'm not gonna leave her side and she's gonna walk out of this hospital. And our prayers were answered. So I, I literally said, uh, God take my life, not hers. And he saved us both. And the Kelly Fund. So uh, I said, I've got to do something. So I started the Kelly Fund for lupus.org. Can you and, put that uh, website up to you in the Kelly Fund? Yeah, the Kelly Fund for Lupus, Inc. I started. And you can go to the Kelly Fund for lupus.org. Um, we raise money for lupus uh, to try and find a cure. It's a chronic disease that can affect anyone, but primarily minority women in the prime of their lives when they are in college and uh, when they're out there energetic like college kids do. Uh, but it also affects men, it affects mm. children. But uh, this uh, on Saturday uh, at Meadowlands Parkway, Saturday, Mother's Day weekend every year, there's a walk for a cure in New Jersey. In New York, it's in October and it's all around the country. You know, before I let you go, what always strikes me is that people Particularly, I don't know, we know the New York, New Jersey market really well. That's where we live, that, that's our world, and you're here now at PIX. People think they know someone because they see you on the air every day. But behind this person on the air is this life that is filled with um, challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you, you bring what you bring every day and you don't bring your issues to those people because they have stuff in their own right. lives, right? Right, everyone has stuff. And, uh, and, and so that someone knows too, my, my daughter survived. Uh, mm, she's 98% yes. back to where she was. Forgive me, I, I tend to go in my own yeah. world. Where, how's she doing my, right now? Tell everybody. She, she's, she's doing great, uh, but lupus is, it doesn't have a cure. She's been in remission now for several years. Yeah. But for many people with lupus, they can literally wake up one morning and their hands may be swollen. Or, you know, for instance, lupus attacked her brain suddenly. Uh, she ended up in a coma. Uh, for anyone else, they may have a rash. Uh, they, they may have what may be a common cold. It may turn into a respiratory issue. Um, I met a man once who had been in a coma twice. He got, uh, his home was taken from him. I mm. mean, because he was hospitalized for months at a time. But he had a praying mom and a praying grandmother, you know. Faith. So, faith. Real, real quick, uh, watch this transition before we let you go. Uh, you and uh, Kaidi, when can people see you? Oh, 6.30, every day, Monday through Friday, Where? on Pix 11. <laughs> Brenda, you're such keep a doll, doing what you're doing. Talk. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Keep doing what you're doing. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get tired of that. But PBS is not about how you look. It's right. about the work we do. Yes. That we like that we look the good. The challenges we face yeah. and we keep beating. Yes, right. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We have to talk, Dad. Well, that's what we're doing, isn't it? I mean, seriously. This is the third one. I said You've... I don't need her. I don't need her or anyone. I can manage very well on my own. She wasn't easy to find, you know. It's not that easy. I thought she was really good. Lots of good qualities. She... And now she doesn't want to work here anymore. You are not listening to what I am telling you. That's good stuff. That's from um, The Father. And we are pleased to be joined by Catherine Irby who is a uh, Tony Award-nominated actress starring in The Father with, and the other guy? Uh, Frank. Frank, Frank Langella, yes. who's terrific, who terrific. plays Andre. You are his daughter. Yes. Set this up for us, it's a powerful situation. It is a powerful situation. Um, so Andre has just um, berated his third caretaker. My husband and I, well, my boyfriend and I have just had to cancel our vacation because of this. Why does he have a caretaker? Um, he, although he doesn't think so, is suffering from dementia. <sighs> set where? It's set in Paris. Give me the translation story. So it's written by a French playwright named Florian Zeller, and um, Christopher Hampton translated it into English for the production in London. And um, then when we started, we spent about a week with Christopher making it more American sounding, less British sounding. Now, it won an award in France, the Moliere Award? Yes. What does that mean? Because that's a big deal. It is a big deal. He is a big deal, this guy, um, Florian. He, he, his voice, People are hungry for, clearly. Everywhere this play has been done and his subsequent plays are all huge hits. People mm. are, are, they're really responding to them. So the translation, when you translate it into English, mm -hmm. how difficult, A, and B, the challenge of connecting with audiences who speak English? Well, um... For us, we wanted it to still be set on foreign soil so that it was, there was some distance between the American audiences and the characters in the play. Um, so we wanted to maintain that, but we didn't want uh, things to sound odd and clunkily British, so words like buggered, <laughs> or uh, not buggered, burgled, excuse me, but what is burgled that? means robbed. 
Okay. Uh, um, uh, so we changed Burgled to Robbed. Okay. And um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. But the translation but, had to be done in a way that people could understand. Yes, yeah, so that people could understand it, but so it maintained the essence of what Florian created. And I, I have never read the French version. My French is not nearly good enough. Um, but I think um, that Christopher did a beautiful job. Let me ask you, this for you, this is your return to Broadway after a few years, 21 years. Yes. What was the last? The last play I did was A Month in the Country with Helen Mirren, F. Marie Abraham, Ron Rifkin. Um, actually, my, I was pregnant with my daughter at the time. And on opening night for the father, she was my guest. And she's 20 and a half now. Wow. So it feels like a significant. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, uh, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, uh, Detective Andrea Ames. Alexandra Ames. Oh, excuse me, yeah. Alexandra Ames. But also, I first saw you on Oz. Shirley. Uh, that's not you. No. Oh, my God. Shirley was crazy? Yeah, she was. And, and, and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, you had these two very successful uh, television experiences. Mm -hmm. The return to Broadway, what's it like? I love doing theater. I, I, every time I do it, I wonder what's wrong with me <laughs> because it feels like an addiction. It is so scary and hard, and I think that's part of why I love it so much. Um, but just that shared experience with this play in particular because mm of the way Florian has written it. Um, it's a collective experience between the audience and the actors of dementia. We're all in it together. No one really understands what's going on. And that immediate emotional connection with a live audience is unlike anything. Um, it's unlike anything else and uh, feels primal. You know, we've done it for as long as anyone can remember. And so many of us, so many people watching us right now, um, are dealing with this issue of dementia with people in our lives and trying to make sense of it. And you are dealing with that in this play. Mm -hmm. um, tell everyone where it is. It's at the Samuel Friedman on 47th Street at Manhattan Theater Club. You know, I'm curious about you. When I first saw you in Oz, and I was just drawn to your character, and. Go back, by the way, go right back and check Oz out. One of the great things about uh, On Demand is you can find it in HBO, right? Mm -hmm. There it is. Never gets old. When did you know? I ask a lot of extraordinary uh, actors this question. When did you know that you wanted to do this and this would be your professional life? I have acted in plays since kindergarten. Since Maybe first grade in Miss Salmon's class, yes. How I do you even remember the, the teacher? I, I, I don't know. I, there are some things I can remember and some things I can't. Um, Miss Salmon's first grade class, I played the little red hen. And um, <laughs> I, there, I just loved, I loved the instant gratification of the applause. I loved the family community feeling of a group of people trying to do this thing together. Um, I'm actually a very shy person, so um, it's not easy. I would, I, I have to work against wanting to keep my back to the audience and embrace letting myself be seen, which is so odd, but I know I'm not the only one. Um, so very early on, I knew I wanted to do it, and I've been lucky that I've been able to do nah, it. It's lucky in a Awful lot of talent. Uh, you mind yes. if I plug again? No, not at all. Catherine Irby and uh, the great Frank Langella um, at the Samuel Friedman Theater on West 47th Street, uh, right down the street from where we are, 66th and Broadway. Uh, it's called The Father. And uh, the Manhattan... Manhattan Theater Club. Manhattan Theater Club. We wish you nothing but the best. Uh, the, the world of public broadcasting wishes you and your colleagues the best. And uh, thank you for not being shy with us. <laughs> Thank you so much. You got it. It's Stay with us. We'll be right back from uh, the WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. Thank you very much. My pleasure. That's great. 
To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Nancy Jo Sales, author of American Girl, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers. Um, Nancy Jo, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's a powerful book. You interviewed 200 girls um, ages 13 to 19 across 10 states. You found such important and powerful things like? Uh, like the constancy of social media, cyberbullying is still very much an issue in girls' lives, uh, sexually explicit content, sharing of nude pictures. Uh, How not young? Well, I heard about this going on in sixth grade. This was from 13-year-olds. Uh, it's happening everywhere, all over the country, every sort of community. Across all socioeconomic. Yeah. Girls worse than boys? Well, I mean... Or different. Girls use social media more than boys do. And they seem to be the more the targets of abuses of social media, like sexual harassment, like cyberbullying. It's interesting. I told you that our son, uh, one of our sons who was 13, is on social media. And I'm trying to figure out Again, they don't, they don't talk to you about it. But do boys and girls post differently? Yes. How so? In general? Well, girls feel a pressure. They don't always give in to this pressure, but they feel a pressure from our culture to post provocative pictures, uh, you know, s sort of pictures in a kind of porn aesthetic where they're posing in certain ways and trying to convey, like, sexual appeal when, when they're very young. And it's, it's not uh, healthy for them. Studies show that what's called sexualization is very damaging to girls. But it's the culture of social media that this is what gets likes. This is what gets followers. Is that what they're looking for? Likes, followers, attention? That's what the rewards of social media are. That's sort of how it's set up. That's kind of what it is. It's a, a, a search for likes. How dangerous? I think it's uh, based on the reporting that I've done and talking to many experts in the field of, you know, of uh, education, and child psychology and so forth. I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot about social media that is really hurtful and, and challenging, especially to girls, both suicide. girls and boys. I'm sorry for interrupting. You came right before you came in. You said another yeah. suicide. Yesterday, there was a report of a suicide of a 14-year-old in... Missouri, and this was off of, this was cyberbullying that happened on Facebook. So you see, it's not always some anonymous site. Sometimes it's very mainstream sites where, where these kind of abuses happen. Very high numbers of kids in the 80, 90 percentile range have witnessed some kind of cyberbullying. High numbers have experienced some kind of cyberbullying. You, you know, one of the quotes, one of the young ladies you talked to, social media, she said, social media is destroying our lives. You asked, why don't you go off it? She said, then I'd have no life. Yeah. This was one of the first things that was said to me in this reporting. And it kind of set the stage for the rest of what I would hear for two and a half years. Um, that is what they feel that, you know, a lot of them, there's this idea that girls just love social media and they just want to be on it all the time. They are on it a lot of the time. Nine to 11 hours, kids are on some kind of screen. But they don't always love it. They feel that it's very, they have very conflicted feelings about it, but they also feel like if they're not involved in it, then they're not part of the conversation. They're not, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what people are talking about at lunch. Did you see the Snapchat story? Did you see what he, she posted on Instagram? It's, be, it's bled into real life. For those of us, for parents who are struggling and know that the iPhone or whatever it is, it's there, do we take the phones away? Do we monitor it? How can, what do we do? I think the first thing that we have to do is to recognize that there is a huge problem. You can't say, not my kid. You can't. It's the culture. It's the culture of social media. We have to recognize that it's addiction to a certain extent. I mean, it has all the hallmarks of addiction. You can't stop thinking about it. You can't stop doing it. Phones don't leave the hand. You know, kids get really upset, you know, like, 
emotional when their phones are taken away. These are all like the hallmarks of an addicted person, you know, and, and studies, some studies do bear out that we're addicted to social media. I mean, the jury's kind of out. I of feel it sometimes. Sure. I react to things I see on the internet. I react to things that people said about me on Twitter. I mean, I mean, intellectually, I realize, hey, wait a minute, but a 14-year-old? Yeah, and also what studies do tell us that what we say and do from behind a screen is different from what we would do face-to-face. -face. We've evolved to communicate face-to-face. -face. Here we are communicating from behind screens. We're likely to be more aggressive, less ethical, and this, you know, these are... These are things that, you know, you really have to think about in terms of children coming up, coming of age, growing up, becoming a person, and, and learning to communicate in an environment in which there's more impulsivity and, and possibly, uh, you know, kids saying and doing things they would never do if they had to actually deal with someone in person. Parents have to deal with this directly. Talk about it. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there's not enough talk going on about it. I hope that with this book, I hope that... So I talk about what you want. We've got a minute left. What do you, what do you want to happen out of this? I wanted... I did the book because I wanted girls to be able to tell in their own voices what's going on. Because we were seeing reports of so many troubling things. And I wanted... It, the book is very much in the voices of girls ages 13 to 19. I wanted them to tell the story to a large extent. There are expert voices and there are people who comment on on this phenomenon. But really, I wanted girls to tell the story. And I wanted them to hear it because, I wanted, I wanted people to hear it because I want parents to know, because kids don't often offer this information. And knowing what they're going through, how they feel about it, how conflicted they are, I'm hoping that this information and this awareness can start a conversation between kids and parents. And frankly, schools have to do more too. Uh, Nancy Jo Sales, you have done an important public service in writing the book American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers for All Parents. I want to thank you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Hackensack University Medical Center Foundation, Investors Bank, Felician University, New Jersey Resources, the North Ward Center, and by Cone Resnick. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. There is a place that pushes beyond traditional thinking to take medicine further than ever before. Where science and creativity work together to give heart and cancer patients new possibilities. And researchers discover options for children who once had none. A place that proves every day that impossible is just an opinion. Hackensack University Medical Center, where medicine meets innovation.